All right, all of you that are here with me virtually to our uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth class, I just want to say welcome. Glad you all are here. Um, I'm going to just begin this time with prayer. Can we just all bow our heads in prayer? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your um, for your word. Your word is living. It's an active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit, bones and marrow. It judges the very thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And so, Father God, I pray that as we come before you right now, in this moment and in every moment that my students uh, will be looking at these videos, I'm asking and praying that, Lord God, you would open up our hearts to receive everything you have for us in your word, and that, Father God, we would learn to rightly divide the word of truth, becoming workmen who are not ashamed, that rightly divide it. God, I pray for this, and God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would overshadow all aspects of this time together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to begin here with um, the with the chapter one PowerPoint, and I'm going to go to uh, slide number two, and I'm just going to read this uh, this next couple of slides here because I think they they set the stage for uh, what we're going to talk about in this class. So it says this: It says every so often we meet someone who says with great feeling, "You don't need to have to you don't need to have to interpret the Bible; just read it and do what it says." Usually such a remark reflects the lay person's protest against the professional scholar, pastor, teacher, or Sunday school teacher who, by interpreting, seems to be taking the Bible away from the common person. It is their way of saying that the Bible is not an obscure book. After all, it is argued, anyone with half a brain can read it and understand it. The problem with too many preachers and teachers is that they dig around so much that they tend to muddy its waters. What was clear to us when we read it isn't so clear anymore. In fact, we are convinced that the single most serious problem that people have with the Bible is not with the lack of understanding it, but with the fact that they understand many things too well. For example, such a text, such a, such a text as do everything without grumbling or arguing, Philippians 2.14, the problem is not understanding it, but obeying it and putting it into practice. So they begin um, this section here talking about how, how many people um, either fail to study the Bible or fail to pursue studying the Bible because they think, hey, as, as long as I just read it and, and read what it says and obey that that's all I need to do. Um, but of course, there's all kinds of problems that arise with that if you just simply interpret the Bible um, through your own interpretation. Like, well, this is what I think it means. And then somebody says, well, this is what I think it means. In other words, the meaning of the Bible becomes very subjective. What, what, is, what is the benchmark for interpreting the Bible? And, and that, that's what this class is going to be all about. And so I encourage you, obviously, to watch these videos. I encourage you to read the chapters as well and follow along with, with the PowerPoints. I, I also encourage you to fill out the study guide that I'm going to be sending you that, again, you can kind of just work this stuff out. Um, one of the best ways of learning that I know is when you can kind of make the information your own. And one of the best ways that I know of making the information your own is by writing out the answers. Um, thoughts have a way of disentangling themselves when you get them on paper. And there's something about, you know, doing the work yourself that you're going to get the most out of this, out of this class. So I hope, uh, I hope that you do that. Um, if you go to slide number four, um, the author talks about the fact that um, the aim of interpretation is not uniqueness. In other words, you're not trying to discover what nobody else has discovered before, but what you're trying to find out is um, the plain meaning of a text, the author's intended meaning. So, so the best way to, to understand the Bible, to read the Bible for all it's worth, and to teach it for all it's worth is you have to do the hard work and what I call that the spade work of what did it mean to the original authors? In other words, what did the Holy Spirit speak to the original recipients of the book of Deuteronomy? Okay, the, the Jewish audience, the Israelites out uh, on the plains of Moab just before they're ready to enter the promised land. How did they hear it? How did they receive it as the Holy Spirit originally gave it, okay? So find out what that originally means before you apply it to today. 
um, the, the danger and the tendency of, of, of most Christians is we, we want to find out what it means for me right now because I'm, I'm going through a crisis or I'm trying to find out what God wants me to do or I'm, I, I don't totally understand what to do with my life right now. So God, please speak to me in your word. But, but if, you, if you're really going to understand it, you have to understand how it was originally communicated by the Holy Spirit to that original audience and then find ways of applying that. So, so that's what we're going to be talking about um, in, in, in this text. So if you go to the next slide, I believe it's slide number five, you know, it talks about um, the most important ingredient to do this is just good old fashioned common sense. Okay. Um, basically, um, I guess, let me just say it this way. Um, if you've ever been in a conversation and somebody personally spoke to you, or if I personally spoke to you, okay? If you really want to understand what I meant when I said it, you have to go back to, okay, the original conversations between me and, let's just come up with a name, it's called Bill, okay? Me and Bill, we're talking, okay? If you want to understand what I meant when I spoke to Bill, you have to go back to that original conversation and understand it from that context. You cannot apply that to today unless you go back into that particular time frame. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, uh, slide number six, it talks about the reader as interpreter, is that um, most of us assume that when we read, we understand exactly what we read. And many times we think that our understanding of what we read in the Bible is exactly the same as the Holy Spirit's intent or the original author's intent. And, and what we've got to understand is what we bring to every text um, all of our experiences, all of our background, all of our culture, all of our prior understanding of words and ideas. Okay, so, so we're gonna um, we're gonna inject that into the way we we understand the Bible. One of the ways that many Christians read the Bible, and and is is that we in, we we um, engage in something C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery is that we think we understand it from the 21st century's perspective much more than what was originally written, so we'll inject our own meaning on it. Um, another way of, of, of terming this is what historians called engaging in the fallacy of presentism. What's presentism? Again, injecting our own interpretation on uh, an, an ancient text, okay? In other words, um, something that... that um, many opponents of the Bible will do, that they will see examples in the Old Testament where it almost seems like God is condoning slavery. And they say, see, the Bible condones slavery. Why would I want to believe in a God that condones slavery? And, and what they fail to understand is they're injecting their understanding of the type of chattel slavery that was in the United States in the 1830s and 1850s and imposing that on an Old Testament text in Deuteronomy or Exodus that talks about slavery when, if you really go back in time and try to understand it, much of the slavery that was condoned by God and mo much of it was allowed because of their sinful condition, but much of the slavery that was supposedly condoned by God was something we would consider today as almost like an indentured servitude where you would, you're in debt to somebody, you can't pay back the debt, okay? Um, so rather than going into prison, you basically work off that debt uh, for a, a number of months or years. And then w when you're done with that and you've paid that off by the years of your servitude, you're free. Okay, again, presentism commits the fallacy of injecting our concept of chattel slavery onto uh, an ancient text that's 3,000, you know, that's reflecting a, a time frame from 3,000 years old. So we've got to be real careful about that. And they, they give examples um, in slide number six where when we hear Roman cross, okay, we're, we're thinking of a cross like this, okay? But most likely the, the cross that Jesus was crucified on was more like a T, okay? So again, injecting our understanding of, again, where did we get that from? We got that from looking at paintings, we got that from maybe looking at movies and things like that. And again, many times they're not always historically accurate, but we're injecting that when we read the cross, okay? Another, another way we do that is when, when we read about a church in worship, okay? Um, 
uh, when we when we when we see it in the book of Corinthians where Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Okay, we're thinking, hey, it it, it he's writing a letter to a church that meets in a building and there's two or three hundred people in the service, something like that. Okay, when in fact there were no church buildings in the early church for the first 300 years of the church's existence, okay? Christianity was either considered illegal or it was considered a subsect of Judaism. And so many times they, they were meeting in, you know, catacombs and caves and secret places and things like that. Um, many times the church at Corinth or the church in Ephesus was basically um, small groups or small house churches that met in various homes. So the letter to the church in Corinth went from this house to that house, to the next house, to the next house. There may have been 10, 15, 20 houses in Corinth that was the church at Corinth. So again, another example of presentism. We, we, when we see the word church in, in the New Testament, we tend to read upon it and, and understand it from the context of what we think about church in the 21st century in the United States of America, okay? Again, go to, um, go to China. Go to some other place where the church is underground. They're gonna read and understand what church is very differently than what you think of because again, they don't have the luxury of meeting in buildings. They don't have the luxury of the First Amendment. They don't have the luxury of, of soul freedom or you know religious liberty. And so they're a persecuted church. So in many respects, the way a persecuted church would read the New Testament is probably far closer to the concept of church than it is for the United States. So again, they're talking about reader as interpreter, is that we all interpret. The problem is we're not interpreting it correctly because of some of those preconceived ideas, biases, chronological snobbery, presentism, um, things like that. So they give some other examples of this, the, the idea of, of reader as interpreter. If you look at slide number seven, um, when Paul says in Romans 13, 14, um, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, quoting from the, the New King James Version, um, most people in English-speaking cultures think of flesh means body, as he's talking about bodily appetites. Um, but the word flesh, as Paul uses it, seldom refers to the body, and it almost all, always deals with your sinful nature, okay? In other words, the flesh means a totally self-centered existence, okay? And so um, this is where we need to realize that the translation of the Bible that you use is your interpretation or your interpreting starting point. And we'll get into this in a later chapter where it's really important that you have an interpretation of the Bible that's closest to the original manuscripts, okay? Because then you're, you're getting a much more accurate meaning than some translations, um, like the King James Version, that is drawing from manuscripts that are perhaps a thousand years removed from the actual events. And you can see where that could become uh, problematic. Because again, um, interpreters choose words. Translators choose words, okay? And again, you can see some of the examples there on the bottom of the slide uh, for the idea of Romans 13, 14, the idea of flesh in the King James and the New International and the New Revised Standard, the New American Standard and things like that. Um, whereas the NIV version of 1984 says sinful nature, the New Jerusalem Bible says natural inclinations. So again, the choice of Bible that you use is interpreting for you and you've got to be aware of that. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop there and we will begin with slide number eight to begin the next section.